thank you very much for having me. And um, basically what I'm gonna do is to put some of the cyber threats into a wider context. Um, there's not gonna be a lot of practical stuff. Um, there's barely gonna be any data oriented zeros and ones. Um, that's, not, that's not really my forte, but um, we will be talking about cyber threats and how this can impact maritime systems. So um, what I'm gonna do is just a short sit rep where we're standing at the moment. Then I'm gonna run through some um, attack methods. Then I'm gonna talk about something called the impact spectrum, which is what I usually use to, to determine what has happened during an attack and how serious it is. Then I'm gonna go over some of the, um, the infamous destructive attacks and the destructive potential of cyber attacks or the lack thereof, as I will get into. Then I will talk about cyber as an enabler. Um, basically, cyber operations or cyber activities enabling other threats like piracy, smuggling, um, interstate warfare, that sort of thing that can also impact the maritime business. Um, and then I'm gonna do a little quick rant about the media because they are definitely not helping the situation when it comes to threat and threat understanding um, in terms of cyber. Right, so um, let's dive into it. The overall threat. We basically seen a sharp increase in attacks in um, 2020 and 21 in the maritime sector. And this is likely a result of perpetrators trying to exploit the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but the increase in attacks was already trending, trending upwards before all of this happened. Um, and I've seen numbers as high as a 900% increase in reported incidents since 2019. Uh, mind you, this is not necessarily successful attacks. It's just attempts have been made. Um, we also have a general trend of increased digitization, as um, I'm sure we've heard a lot about now, and then computerization across the maritime sector, both in terms of operating systems on vessels and operating systems. Um, I will abbreviate operation system to OT uh, inside ports. So more and more elements of the maritime business is run via computers and its network. And simultaneously, we also have a situation where the use of cyber attacks is becoming more and more common more and more types of perpetrators use these capabilities. And we see everything from small time criminals to activists to organized criminals to major state powers utilizing this. So a lot of people can actually you know, use these capabilities. Still the major or the large majority of the attacks out there are still small scale. Um, it's the mass produced attacks going out to multiple servers with modest overall effect on target systems. Um, so while we hear a lot about the major cases those are not the most common ones. We also mostly see simple software attacks, meaning that this is something that mostly affects software aspects of systems. And again, while it is trending upwards, it's still a small minority of incidents that are related to operating systems. Um, this is because the most common perpetrator is mainly interested in some sort of economic gain, and you don't necessarily need to bring down physical systems and entire ships and ports to have a credible when ransomware attack, for example. Now, I will be mentioning some of these throughout the presentation. So I'll just do a quick run through of the main cyber weapons used against the maritime sector. We have the DDoS attacks where you overwhelm service with too many requests, often just as pure harassment. Then we have brute forcing where you put password generator to grind itself through every possible combination to a login. And then in theory, eventually um, people gain access. And then we have the SQL injection and SQL injection is a process of finding vulnerabilities in software or websites. Then you insert a computer code via these weaknesses and, and then achieve some sort of insight or disruption or control. Um, just as a reference, this is what the movie uh, hackers always do. Then we have the phishing, which is the classic email um, from the prince in Nigeria. You can get a lot of money if you just give out your bank details. Um, however, we also have seen some more better targeted versions these past few years. Um, and so I don't even have this degree of previous reconnaissance of a company. For example, if you suddenly get an email from your boss telling you to transfer money to some account ASAP. Um, this is also known as CEO fraud. And we have some gen general email fraud. Um, an example was the 2018 Gold Galleon, where hackers compromised email conversations between maritime business partners, um, so shipping companies, brokers, ports, etc. They will then survey the conversation, insert themselves into the correspondence and the emails, and then add their own account numbers and payment solutions when that became time. Um, 
And this is also known as a man in the middle attack. So this is also seen elsewhere. Now, impact. When I was planning this presentation, I was a bit in doubt on how to focus because cybersecurity and cyber threats is a lot of things. It's the actors, it's the cyber kill chain, vulnerabilities, cyber defense, all of this. Uh, but because of the complexity of the issue and because, as I'm sure you'll be aware uh, about most of these concepts by now, especially vulnerabilities in cyber defense, I settled with my own favorite subject, which is impact. Uh, because while it is important to understand the wider concept of the cyber realm, it's cyber weapons, cyber threat actors, and so on, uh, impact is still one of the main ways of understanding why and to what extent something is dangerous and how will this ruin my day. Um, so in terms of analysis, this is key. Um, I will for this presentation focus on impact on operations and assets and not as much finances and reputation. Uh, of, although these are also uh, uh, very important in terms of um, measuring the impact, but again, this will purely be on systems and the physical. Another reason why I want to discuss the impact is that it seems that a lot of people consider cyber attacks to be this extremely dangerous thing and often overestimate significantly the destructive potential of cyber weapons. Um, not just against software, but also in terms of taking control of physical systems, basically to the extent where everything with an internet connection can be turned into a weapon that will take you and your entire society out or company. So um, th this is what uh, is called the destructive cyber attacks. So the cyber attacks capable of not just affecting data and software, but that can actually have a kinetic effect, so a physical effect. Um, while everybody seems to regard this as a reasonable plausible scenario, I just want to calm the waters a little bit and discuss why this is unlikely in the, um, in the current climate. Another reason I want to focus on the impact of attacks rather than threat actors is that when it comes to cyber, the, you know, from the lone hacker in the basement to the hackers in the national intelligence services, the weapon types are basically the same. And normally in my work as an analyst, when you discuss threats against maritime sector and others, the different actors, the criminals, non-state, states, states etc., have different methods and weapons available when they attack. For example, high-tech weapons like fighter jets are usually only something that states have at, at their disposal. You don't really see Greenpeace doing that. Um, and we like to group threats as analysts, depending on the threat actor's intent and capabilities. So what do they want to do and how do they do it? And um, this slide is a bit oversimplified for, um, for our purposes. Uh, but bear with me, because activists uh, are usually pretty crude. They want to protest and have their voices heard, and they usually just have rocks if things get violent. Criminals want money, and if they have to coerce you into giving it to them, then they usually have bladed weapons or sometimes guns to make you stand and deliver. Insurgents often lack significant military power and weapon support, and they will usually shift between small arms and bombs to carry out sabotage or subversive activities. And then, of course, the states have all the toys, the tanks, the cruise missiles, aircraft carriers, etc. So the threat actor usually have a specific set of capabilities fitting their station, depending on what their motivation is. Uh, and then you have a pretty good idea about what their capabilities um, they will throw at you. This also means that you can then prepare accordingly. You can train your people um, to counter the most relevant threats. You can... Uh, set up measures that will mitigate or counter the capabilities of the people that want to do harm and so on. But this is not exactly how cyber works. And this is why cyber can sometimes be a bit difficult for old school security types like me. Because in cyberspace, everyone basically, um, with uh, some modifications, basically uses the same bits of tools. They use the weapons I ran through earlier, the DDoS, various forms of malware, phishing attacks, brute forcing, SQL injections, and so forth. Again, the scope of the operations may change depending on the threat actor, and the ultimate objective may differ, from the activist wanting to deface a website of an oil major to state-run intelligence units attempting to shut down command and control. And then, of course, the overall planning and execution resources may also be greater for state actors who can carry out more complex attacks. But the way they get you, the way they breach your systems, are usually the same. It's still the phishing, it's the malware, brute forcing, it's your employee Carl plugging in the wrong USB key and so on. And this is also why my focus will not be on the impact because while all seem to use the same tools, the impact, depending on what the threat act's intent is, will vary greatly. 
So I want to present to you the impact spectrum. Um, this is originally a cyber warfare framework, but I've tweaked it a little bit just so it works for us today. It basically shows the type of attack and how this will impact your business on a spectrum between cyberspace, meaning software getting damaged, and the physical world, meaning that the attack has a direct physical effect. Um, and with this, I also want to highlight some of the nuances of the pure cyberspace versus physical attack. And again, maybe calm the waters a little bit on the fears related to the physical or so-called destructive cyber attacks, as I mentioned earlier. All the way to the left, we have the scams. The attack usually barely does anything to software. It's usually just communication via email, as I mentioned before, um, where the criminals try to get to send you money. Then we have the network denial. So making sure communication is disrupted to ruin your day, but not directly actually breaching your systems. Uh, this is pure harassment often. And again, this is often the DDoS attack. Software data surveillance, the common spyware attacks where someone plans software that allows them to look and extract, but not exactly disrupt and destroy data. Um, this is often achieved with brute forcing, forcing, phishing, and SQL injections, as the perpetrators now actually need to get inside the targeted systems. They don't need that for scams or network denial usually. Um, and these weapon types are used throughout the rest of the right side of the spectrum, as indicated by the red arrow below. Then we have software and data denial. This is where the hacker prevents some elements of your software from being accessed or working properly. Probably. This is usually the classic malware attack that ruins various data and software or the ransomware attacks. So a hacker gets into a system and encrypts vital bits and pieces, the system stops working and the perpetrator will demand a ransom payment. Um, these attacks may be quite serious as the hackers will have to attack important or maybe even critical systems to be able to demand a big ransom. Um, so this is also where we see operational systems starting to getting affected. For example, if the hackers have managed to target that system critical enough. This is also where we see some of the more famous cases. Um, for example, this is the, uh, the Garmin attack and the colonial pipeline attack from May, where, the, where these fit in. Um, basically, the colonial pipeware, pipeline attack was a ransomware attack enabled by a compromised password. Um, then spiraled into something else, but I will get back to that. Now we get to some of the more intense stuff, which is the mission part of the spectrum. And mission here means your core mission. So the one thing that keeps you and your business relevant. Mission denial means that an attacker has gained access to your systems to such a degree that they can actually directly target and shut down, disrupt, or destroy a core mission and operating systems, so your OT systems. Uh, this is not some attack that just disrupts your support or auxiliary systems. It's something that literally grinds your core assets to hold. And arguably, some very serious ransomware attacks can have this quality, but usually they are just, uh, or they just disrupt some software nuts and bolts and not go after main elements because these are generally more difficult to disrupt. However, um, with many non tech companies, um, you know, uh, these bits and pieces are usually the OT systems that are affected. And then suddenly the cyber attack, which inherently is non-physical serious and once, can have some direct physical qualities. An example of this is the Estonian and Ukrainian power grids attacks in 2007 and 2015. And finally, we have the, the beast and the revelation, uh, if you want to call it that, which is the mission manipulation attack. This is where an attacker is capable of accessing and in effect control your core mission systems. And the central known example, uh, and I actually think the only known example of this is the Stuxnet attack against the Iranian nuclear program in 2010, which, um, which over time and undetected could took control of um, uranium enrichment centrifuge in the um, Natanz facility. It then accelerated their speed and eventually broke them, setting back the enrichment efforts considerably. Um, now, the final two here, mission denial and manipulation, are usually the type of attacks that states and militaries are mostly concerned about because of the inherent destructive um, and control aspects. Please also note here that the more physical an attack has to be, the more complex it usually is. Uh, this is also why mission denial and manipulation is mostly thought about as being the thing state actors are capable of. It takes a lot of resources, planning, and sometimes physical and human assets to successfully execute such an attack. And the complex operation behind the Stuxnet attack against the Iranian nuclear program is a great example of this, 
in terms of planning that took ages, setting up similar uh, hardware to test, and then actually doing um, insertion of the um, of the worm into the um, into the facility. Now, if we apply all this to the maritime sector, I've added this red curve here to indicate where most cyber attacks take place. And as you can see, it's mostly on the left side with non-physical effects. And again, while we have a lot of attacks, this does not mean successful attacks. It just means more attempts were made. Um, and of course, if all you cyber professionals out there in the maritime sector gets better, we will have fewer successful attacks. But again, people will still try to get in. So we have a lot of scams. We have a lot of spyware and then a relatively large portion of software and data denial attacks. So the ransomware of a less impact. And then some mission denial and manipulation attacks. So malware and ransomware impacting OT. And these I would argue are the main cyber threats against the maritime sector due to the examples of capability we have seen, the potential gain for the attacker and the potential effect um, it can actually have on our operating systems. This is also the type of attacks that fit into the category with the most disruptive cases. Um, we have the MSC attack where website and booking was down for several days in 2020. The Costco attack in 2018 where local communication in the US was down. And then of course the infamous mask, not Petya attack, which disrupted a lot of hardware and ended up with a considerable cost in operations and hardware. So physical spillover here already with hardware getting damaged. And we have seen attacks against um, operating systems in ports. Uh, most recently, we have the um, Shahid Raji port attack from 2020, which created massive backlogs. And similarly, there are also reports of attacks against vessel operating system software, um, although the breaches of these systems does not seem to have been extensive um, or have lasted very long. So overall, the malware and ransomware attacks with physical impact into OT systems are still the main threat. Now, this in my view, why we don't really see a lot of the destructive, destructive attacks, excuse me, is because of a lack of intent. And I mentioned this because when dealing with threats and understanding threats, it's essential to differentiate between the capabilities that are out there and the intent of those possessing these capabilities. One of the great, probably apocryphal legends of intelligence tells of how proud the US military was during the Cold War because they could walk into the Oval Office and inform the president about exactly how many tanks, rifles, troops, and bits of ammunition the Soviet Union had. And then the president ruined the party by asking what the Soviet Union was planning on doing with these capabilities. So their intent. And the military basically had no idea because they had focused solely on capability, what the Russians had, and basically had no idea if they would walk into Berlin tomorrow or not. So that intelligence picture was incomplete. It's simply not enough to say that there is a lot of scary stuff out there, which I find a lot of people do. Um, and again, it is important, but you still have to be able to link that scary stuff to an actor. And that actor has to want to do something that harms you for it to be an actual threat or a relevant threat, I would say. And in my view, the actors capable of doing all this horrible stuff, the states um, who want to do physical harm to maritime assets, and not just harass others and create backlogs, already have plenty of other conventional means to do that. So whether the goal is to take control of your vessel or just put it out of commission, it will still be the frogmen with the mines, it's waterborne IDs, attack boats, commandos and helicopters that are used because those things are still easier to deploy in operational terms than a complex cyber attack. Um, this is not to say that complex cyber attacks with destructive effects are impossible and it will never happen, um, because it probably can be done. And I also suspect that a lot of the larger OT harassment cases are probably tests of capabilities for potential future use. But there is a lot of advanced cyber capabilities, and I would argue that states are still the sole actor capable of conducting a destructive attack. And again, a kinetic attack that harms people and physical assets. And I doubt that they would do that in any situation short of an actual war. And of course, cyber warfare is a thing that is being developed and preparation and mitigation through cybersecurity is absolutely important and prudent for such scenarios. Um, I'm also happy to talk about cyber war in the Q&A, but in my view, this is not the main threat to the maritime sector 
as it is right now. I'm sure the maritime sector is not particularly worried about a NATO-Russia war, for example, and what to do in that situation, at least not in terms of what do we do right now with our risk management. So hopefully you can rest a bit easier then. However, that does not mean that the usual suspects, the pirates, smugglers, the states, again, et cetera, can or won't use cyber to their advantage. Because while these types usually have other capabilities, as I mentioned, they might still use cyber as an enabler for their intended objectives as part of, of a wider operational setup. And I want to talk a little bit about that because it's something that's often overlooked when discussing cyber threats. And let's start out with piracy, um, because pirates continue to operate in several places across the world. And um, this is also one of the main things we survey here at Risk Intelligence. And there actually are unconfirmed but suspected uses of cyber attacks by pirate groups or affiliates. And this is mostly related to incidents where the pirates have had a lot of insight about the intended target, uh, its valuable cargo and similar, um, which points to a potential spyware attack through which the pirates have gained intelligence on, you know, how to approach this ship and what to go after once they board. We've also seen reports of cases in oil producing regions where it appears that pirate groups have gained access to refinery lock systems, um, basically to figure out which departing vessels to siphon. Um, still, this could be down to human insider sources rather than spyware, uh, but it definitely highlights um, a way for pirates to utilize cyber capabilities. Um, and this would also be inside a reasonable range of what they would be able to, so their capabilities. So something to be aware of. Now onto smuggling. Um, this is um, pretty Eurocentric, but the technique is actually quite interesting. Because in Europe, we see a lot of predominantly cocaine smuggling using containers landing in, um, in Western ports. And basically the smugglers place the drugs in legal containers in ports in South America and they are then picked up by criminal groups upon arrival in ports in Europe. And now to identify the container in question and gain access to the port, these criminal groups often use insiders or bribe port workers. Um, however, this can actually also be enabled by cyber attacks. And we have a confirmed incident from a port of Antwerp in Belgium where organized crime groups had cooperated with hackers to identify and secure containers with cocaine shipped from South America. And basically, the hackers use spyware planted in port company computers to get information on usernames, passwords, pin codes for physical security barriers. And the criminals then basically just use this information to enter the port premises, posing as port workers, remove their target containers, and get out. And in this case, the cyber attacks actually enabled the removal of 2.2 tons of cocaine and one ton of heroin. So, you know, this is um, a relatively big operation, lots of money behind it. And of course, the cyber attack here may not seem like much. But you have to remember that suddenly this cyber attack becomes part of enabling, an enabling part of an extremely violent criminal enterprise where we often have uh, cases of workers and sailors being severely beaten and actually also tortured and killed if they stumble upon ongoing drug extractions. And then we arrive at military operations because as many of you will know, cyber has become one of the new great things in military thinking. It's actually being called the fifth war fighting dimension now. Basically, the maritime industry has been hit multiple times by cyber warfare capabilities in the form of GPS spoofing. So GPS spoofing is the intentional changing of AIS positioning signals. Um, and it basically means that a signal, GPS, AIS signal is hijacked, changed, and then transmitted to receivers. And spoofing has actually occurred in several areas, both over short and longer times. One of the most famous cases uh, have been the Black Sea of the Russian uh, coast. Um, and has been linked to site protection of the Russian presidential palace and has coincided with pres um, President Putin's visits. This is the, um, the graphic on top. Um, we've also seen some um, so-called crop circles in China where there have been some pretty aggressive GPS proofing detected in almost 20 coastal sites during 2019. And some of these impacted AIS considerably. And this included major hubs like Shanghai and Fuzhou and often occurred near oil facilities. And it's basically speculated that this was done to cover up import of embargo crude oil. So again, cyber capabilities used as a part of a wider operational setup. Um, again, spoofing itself is mainly a safety issue as wrong AIS signals may lead to collisions or groundings, but it could also be used to, for example, lead vessels into territorial waters for direct action boardings or sieges. Um, we've seen this, um, we have, 
heard rumors that we have seen this in the, um, in the Persian Gulf, for example. Yeah, and now here at the end, I want to talk a bit about the media. And I apologize if in advance is this comes off more as a rant than anything else. But um, I think it's very important to note the media's mainly negative role in this. Because the general news media covering cyber attacks do a, often do a poor job and isn't helping at all. Um, relatively non-serious cyber incidents are often blown out of portion by bad headlines. And journalists are generally not really grasping the nuances of the situations or have the insights in cybersecurity to give relevant uh, reporting the same way as they usually have experts on hand for almost any other security related thing. And um, all of this is often made significantly worse by the public not knowing exactly what cyber actually means and what it is and what it can do. And as mentioned earlier, this is probably a Hollywood thing. Um, and everybody just believes that the whole thing is extremely dangerous. And um, I want to go back to the colonial pipeline attack from May, because I think it's a good, good case, a good place to start. Again, this was a simple attack. Someone had obtained credentials for a known password and used it to gain access to a server, left what's basically a digital post-it note demanding a ransom. Um, however, because of how the company chose to handle it, um, they chose to shut down its systems. Um, this had direct physical implications, and it basically shut down OC systems. Um, I don't know enough about it to say whether or not this was prudent, although I'm fairly confident that the people behind it knew what they were doing at, and they wouldn't take these precautions if they weren't necessary. So again, conduct, conducting real-time incident management. Um, and again, the cyber attack itself did not really have any physical qualities as far as I'm, I've heard. Um, and in fact, it was a pretty straightforward, simple attack. Uh, then someone found out that it was um, maybe a hacker group with servers in Russia, DarkSide, uh, which is a criminal group mainly in it for Bitcoins, um, who may have been behind it. But still in the media, this simple attack with the company shutting down its own systems to contain and alleviate the situation in the media became, and I quote, biggest US fuel pipeline shut down in cyber attack that may originate in Russia, end quote. And this is from the BBC. Now, this headline basically to the layman says that a major piece of critical infrastructure, made worse by it being something fuel, is now offline because Russia, which is the greatest boogeyman aside from China, have shut it down. So in short, the US is under attack. And this perfectly highlight the potential secondary effects of cyber attacks, which is outside the company's control, because eventually we saw the whole situation of mass panic, fuel hoarding across the entire US Eastern seaboard, because you know our fuel is cut and the reds are coming. Um, and actually the group behind this, allegedly behind this, um, even went public and said that this was not what was supposed to happen because we're in it to make money and we don't really care about large scale disruption. And this is weird. So, my point here is um, to remember to read industry articles on cyber attacks and not rely on general news media for in your information, because in many cases, they are insufficient sources for actionable intelligence and cyber threats. And also just in general, more knowledge and awareness about cyber is pretty important going forward, not just for industry professionals like you people out there who are listening here and who will be on the front lines in the coming years, but definitely also in wider society. And we need to be able to talk about this subject better. So wrapping up, cyber attacks remain a great threat against the maritime sector. It's still primarily software oriented. Um, main disruptive force is ransomware malware. The threat against OT systems is trending, but I wouldn't call it high yet, but it's definitely something to watch. Cyber is used as an enabler for other activities and um, the media is a player and you need to be aware of that. And also always remember that the people out there threat actors they are usually one step ahead and they have a lot of fantasy so they will keep trying to get at us at from every angle they can basically and um i guess that was all from me thank you very much